It's a pleasure to have Dr. Ved Prakash Gupta from JNU as a speaker in this session. Uh, so he will be speaking on some aspects of the theory of subfactors. So Ved. Thank you so much for the introduction and for this opportunity. And of course, congratulations to the organizers. Organizers, you know, this is amazing stuff. You know, being able to hold such a meeting during these difficult times. Also. This is the title, and uh, let me first give you the overview about how I'll take you through this talk. So first of all, uh, you already heard about sister algebras in Sutul's talk. I'll quickly recall that as well, and then take you to what we call Vonneman algebras. These were objects introduced by Vonneman in 1930s. Okay. Then uh, I'll talk about what are the building blocks of Vonneman algebras. These are the objects which are called factors. I'll define those things and we'll see some theory and some classification, classification results uh, that people obtained about factors. Okay. After that, I'll come to the main topic, which we call subfactors, and these uh, objects basically, you know, came into prominence in order to understand factors well. Okay, so I'll talk about that. I'll give you some examples, some theory, and some structure results. There, there are far too many to accommodate in a talk, so I'll concentrate on certain parts, which will be kind of accessible to a general audience like this. And then I'll focus on one important tool you know, that is used heavily in the theory of subfactors, which we call Pinsner-Popa basis. And in that direction, uh, Juan Jones, who kind of is considered to be the pioneer of the theory of subfactors, had asked uh, uh, an analog, analogous question, analogous to what is called Hall's Maris theorem in uh, combinatorics or group theory. So, so I'll discuss that. And the uh, last two slides might be, you know, we'll focus on something that we achieved in this direction in a joint work with Keshav Chandra Bakshi, who is at CMI and inspired faculty there right now. Okay, so let us start. And uh, as I said, there are some common games that operator algebraists are fond of, namely sister algebras and Vonneman algebras. So can you give you a, a very wonderful example of continuous functions on a compact group? You know, it forms a sister algebra. He gave you the definition, the way it forms everything. But we will be so we will be kind of not getting into such particular examples. So, so we'll be discussing the theory from a general perspective perspective so and the and the playground for the operator algebraists is the space of this is the notation that we usually use so we consider all continuous linear operators on h and it turns out to be a c star algebra precisely uh, the way Sukhanu had defined and quickly recalling this there's the properties that this object has to satisfy it's a vector space it has an algebra, it has an involution, it has a norm, you know, it's a Banach space with this norm, with all these nice compatible conditions. So in general, our sister algebra is a Banach space with an associative multiplication structure and an involution satisfying the above properties. Okay. And uh, I think you also heard this theorem in Sutanish talk that every sister algebra can actually be realized as a non-closed star subalgebra of B of H for some Hilbert space H. Okay, this was the famous theorem by Gelfand, Nymark, and Siegel. I think this came in 1940s. So now we move to uh, the next uh, game and that we call Vonneman algebra. So how do we define that? And as I said, our playground now will now be just B of H. Okay, so we have to look for nice games that we can play with. So on B of H, interestingly, there are various locally convex topologies, fine? Even if you're not aware of this term, locally convex topologies, you can just ignore that. We will be particularly interested in the weak operator topology, the first one in the list, fine? And I'll just quickly give you the definition of this. It basically says that, now this is not a metrizable topology, so we will just talk about convergence in terms of nets, okay? So we say that a net in B of H converges to some operator T 
in the weak operator topology if it satisfies this, which is essentially saying that it is converging weakly, uh, it is converging point-wise to, to T in the weak topology on H. Okay, by this representation theorem, we know that every functional, continuous functional, is given by taking inner product with respect to a fixed vector in the second coordinate. So that is why this is saying that Ti xi converges to T xi weakly for every xi in H. Fine. So this is what we call the weak operator topology. So you can say this is the weak topology on H. And then we can easily give you the definition. So initially you uh, saw that a C star algebra is basically a non-closed star subalgebra of B of H. And likewise, a von Neumann algebra is actually a weak operator topology closed unital. Uh, that is to be added here, that we will not be considering non-unital weak operator topology closed objects. Okay? It has its consequences and it's kind of uh, very important for this theory. So we'll just uh, restrict ourselves to unitary star subalgebras of B of H. Fine. So remember the difference. A C star algebra is going to be a non-closed star subalgebra of B of H, and a von Neumann algebra is going to be uh, something which is weakly closed unital star subalgebra of B of H. And well, I did not. You can easily see that if T i converges to T in norm, then it also converges weakly. To T, right? So therefore, it follows that if something is weakly closed, it has it is also non-closed. So every von Neumann algebra is also a C star algebra. Okay. Now I'll give some easy examples. B of H, of course, is a von Neumann algebra, and then the easy ones, matrix algebras, and you take some direct sums of those. You can give coordinate-wise multiplication on this, and you know you can let it act on some nice suitable Hilbert space, and then you see that it is weakly uh, closed there. In fact, every finite dimensional von Neumann algebra is of this type, by which I mean that it has to be. If you have a finite dimensional von Neumann algebra or a finite dimensional C star algebra, it has to be a direct sum of matrix algebras. That's one nice structure theorem that we have. And this is not attributed to any famous mathematician because this can be proved by elementary tools. Okay? And this is usually done in a uh, course on C star algebras or von Neumann algebra. Uh, I'll a few more. Yes. So now let us see some uh, more, you know, uh, distinguishing properties between these two objects. Like you already saw in Sutton's talk that C of a G, where he talked about a group, or you take any compact Hausdorff space X. In particular, if you just take the compact interval zero one and look at continuous functions on that, you can think of those functions as, you know, multiplication operators on L201, and there it turns out to be a C star algebra, which is not a von Neumann algebra. Okay, so this is important. So there you can actually cook up a net which converges, which cannot converge in C01 in the weak operator topology. Fine. Now, how about a von Neumann algebra? So you basically, so, so how do, what do you do actually? So what will be the weak operator topology closer of C01? It turns out to be the it's the collection of all essentially bounded functions on F2, uh, C01, fine? And here uh, you are looking at uh, the measure as the Lebesgue measure on C01, okay? Now here is one interesting thing that you must notice that this object, which was the closer of the top object, uh, C01, also has this interesting property that it is a dual space as a Banach space. Okay, and this intrinsic property was, you know, nicely noticed by Sakai in 1971, and he characterized that you take a C star algebra, and then, like, it's a natural question, right? When is it going to be a von Neumann algebra? So this is one fundamental theorem that uh, he established. He showed that a C star algebra, which is the dual of some Banach space, has to be a von Neumann algebra. You just saw an example on the top, but there is a general theorem like this, that whenever you have a C star algebra, and if it happens to be the dual of some Banach space, then it has to be a von Neumann algebra. Okay, so that was one nice uh, theorem by Sakai in 71. Now I guess I can, yeah, so let us now also talk about two structure theorems. I, and again, one of these was used by Sutano. Uh, you remember when he was trying to tell you that when you have some object, uh, which is a compact quantum group, then you can extract a, quant a compact group from it or something like that. And there he said that there is this theorem by Gelfand and Nyamag that every commutative sister algebra is of the form 
C-notex. So I'm writing C-notex for functions vanishing at unity because I'm taking non-unital C structure algebras as well. In his talk, the whole focus was on unital C structure algebras. Okay. So if you have a non if you have a commutative and say general C structure algebra, not necessarily unital, then it has to be of the form C-notex for some locally compact Hausdorff space X. Okay. And it's quite easy to extract this space X. You use the weak star topology, you look at the multiplicative functionals, you know, and it's done. Again, it's now a part of a course in, on upper algebras. And likewise, how about the commutative volumen algebras? Now, I don't even remember whom was, is this attributed to. So I forgot I could not dig it out also. So every commutative volumen algebra is again of the form L infinity X mu for some nice measure space X and a nice measure mu on that. Now extracting a measure space here is not that obvious. Okay? That requires some serious volumen algebra theory techniques. Fine. So these were two, you know, really classical uh, structure results. The first one, as I said, was 40s and this one also was around 40s or 50s, I think. Yeah. Okay, so now let us see some other uh, categories which give one number algebras. So the first one I'll uh, consider are what we call group von Neumann algebras. Okay, so these were one of the first examples considered by von Neumann in his famous uh, paper, Rings of Operators, that appeared in Annals of Mathematics in uh, 1931 or 32, sometimes like that. Actually. So what uh, he did was that he started with a discrete group G and then considered the left regular representation of G on L2G. Okay, so every G is mapped to a unitary on L2J and it is basically translating the unitary, the canonical unitary basis, just, how should I say, it? it's just like the translation uh, unitary, so it's like a permutation matrix there. So you look at that regular representation, I'm not de defining it deliberately so that we don't make it technical. And then you look at the von Neumann algebra generated by the image of the left regular representation. I used a double commutant notation here because there is a theorem by von Neumann which says that, you know, you look at the von Neumann algebra generated by a certain class of operators. And on the other hand, you look at the double commutant of that class of operators. They are both same, okay, under some nice conditions. So, you, so we can very well write double commutant for the von Neumann algebra generated by lambda G. So this kind of uh, von Neumann algebras are called group von Neumann algebras. You know, we'll, we'll keep referring to this as we move ahead. Then there is another notion uh, of obtaining another way or another factory, I would say, of obtaining von Neumann algebras, um, which is called cross product von Neumann algebras. And uh, this essentially you know, uh, came from ergodic theory because in ergodic theory, you typically land up in a situation where you have a nice group with some nice action on some nice probability space, for instance. Okay, and then you look at you know measure preserving, preserving transformations, ergodic sets, and all that kind of stuff. There. Now, what happens is that if you have such a situation, this is also called in some sense uh, measure theoretical dynamical, dynamical systems. If you have such a scenario, then you can actually make extend this action to the to an action of G on the space L infinity x mu. Okay, so I'm not giving the details. So like in Sukhano's talk, you came across semi-direct product, notion of semi-direct product. So what was happening there? The, you saw that the circle group was actually acting on the special unitary uh, group SU2. And then you took the semi-direct product and you got the whole unitary group, right? So, so in similar way, you can actually hook up what is called a cross product of uh, a G which is acting on this one Neumann algebra L infinity X mu. And this is, th this gives you, you know, a variety of one Neumann algebra that you can play with. And these were the initial objects that help people to answer some questions that come out in the theory of one Neumann algebra. So that will this happen or will this not happen? That kind of questions were essentially answered by hooking up nice, groups, nice measure spaces, nice actions, so that the resulting cross product von Neumann algebra had that nice property or did not have a property that people thought would be there in every von Neumann algebra. Okay, so these were some really significant objects uh, that were used heavily in the beginning of the theory. And even today, there are some serious open problems uh, that people are trying to tackle in this context. 
Okay, so then more generally, what we can do is that, you know, instead of looking at an axon on the measure space, you can actually look at an axon on a Von algebra. The way you had it in the ergodic theory situation, you started with an axon of a group on a measure space, you got an axon of the group on this Von algebra. So more generally, you can just start with an axon of a group on a Von algebra and talk about the cross product for that. Fine. So this also gives you amazing collection of Von algebra. So this will again come into the picture as we move ahead. Now, after that, I would say this is, uh, so, so these uh, two, the ergodic theory and the von Neumann dynamical systems, von Neumann dynamical systems uh, were classical, you know, these were, some, these were the kind of constructions that von Neumann uh, did it in 1930s. And now then came this notion of Cox algebras and Wickhoff algebras. And these things actually came up when people started discussing subfactors more. You'll soon realize why is it that these things came naturally in the picture when people started discussing some factors of the given uh, factor. Now here what happens is that you start with a Cox algebra or a Wickhoff algebra. I'm not defining that, but it is something similar to what Sutunu did. So the difference is that his objects were mainly commutative there, right? Uh, not necessarily, I mean, that was an example. So, so when he talked about compact quantum groups, he started with a unital sister algebra with two structures, right? Multiplication and co-multiplication and they were compatible with each other. You add some more structures to sub, such objects and you restrict your sister algebra to be finite dynamics. Fine, so, so such objects are called Cox algebras and weak, weak, I forgot, it's weak Cox algebras, okay? So such objects also have some nice actions on von Neumann algebras and then there is a analogous notion of cross product that yields wonderful von Neumann algebras. Okay, so again, uh, avoiding the details. So, so this is a general uh, view that I wanted to give you that th there are various objects in various categories that help us to get hold of von Neumann algebras with specific properties that we desire to have or desire not to have. You know, both things are done using this kind of object. Likewise, you know, as I said, you also have notions of uh, creating a von Neumann algebra starting with a quantum group or starting with something called conformal field theory. I really don't know much about this, so I'll not talk more, but th there are such as, uh, ways, you know, there are some well-studied ways of doing this. Okay, so th this was all that I wanted to tell about how people obtain von Neumann algebras, fine? Now we come to what we call uh, the building blocks of von Neumann algebras, namely factors. So what do I mean by building blocks, right? So this was, this uh, extremely useful and famous theorem of von Neumann and might be Murray also in 1930s, where he realized, you know, that early that actually every von Neumann algebra is quote unquote measurably semi-simple. Okay. So when we say that an object is semi-simple, for instance, you know that I think we study in our uh, basic course on C star algebra that every C star if, uh, every representation of a sister algebra can be written as a direct sum of irreducible representations, right? So the irreducible representations are kind of the sim simple objects. And you're saying that every, every representation is the direct sum of such simple objects. So in a similar vein, what we say is that every von Neumann algebra is measurably semi-simple. And a technical way of putting it is that it is a direct integral, okay? Instead of direct sum, since I am saying measurably semi-simple, there is a measurable notion of direct sum, which is called direct integral, okay? And the family also then has to be a measurable family of factors. Now, what are factors? So a factor is a von Neumann algebra with trivial center, okay? So there is nothing other than the scalars that commutes with everything else. And the most exam obvious example that should come to your mind is the matrix algebras, right? So if you take a matrix algebra, let us say two by two matrices, then we know that the only matrix or the only matrices that commute with everything else are the scalar matrices, okay? Likewise, B of H for any Hilbert space H. So there also the only operator, the operators that uh, commute with everything else are just the scalar times identity of it. Okay? So, so this aspect is encoded in this uh, notation that center of M is basically C times the identity operator. So such Von algebras are called factors. Fine. Now, yeah, so, and he was 
so true genius after all we all know that and he you know quickly realized and this was also done i think in one of those four or five papers in annals that you know the there are there are abundantly many projections in uh, one one algebras as well as in factors which is very unlike when you compare to sister algebra there are some sister algebras which do not admit any projection at all i mean for instance you just look at the sister algebra of continuous functions on the interval 0 1 right you cannot have a projection there yeah it's a nice commutative sister algebra but it does not have a single non trivial projection whereas when you look at von neumann algebras there are abundantly many and the reason being that you always have a copy of l infinity x sitting inside your von neumann algebra and you know l infinity has lots and lots of characteristic functions and every characteristic function is a projection okay so every von neumann algebra has lots of projections in fact there are that many that they can span the whole space it's fine and then there is a nice way of comparing projections for instance in l infinity if you have two characteristic functions you would compare two characteristic functions depending on the measure of their ambient spaces isn't it so likewise you can compare two projections whether one can be thought of as a smaller to other and the other can be thought of as a smaller to these or they can be thought of as equivalent to each other this is what is called murray von neumann notion of equivalence of or comparison of projections fine now depending upon the mutual behavior among projections factors are classified broadly into three different types and this classification was again done by uh, von neumann and more else i should i should have written his name also here also so there are just three broad types of factors type 1 type 2 and type 3 under type 1 everything is known and explicitly these are one ends and one infinity and one ends correspond to matrix algebra so if you have a finite dimensional factor it has to be a matrix algebra period and if you have an infinite dimensional factor it uh, type 1 factor then it has to be of edge so this is the classification about type 1 factors then comes type 2 this is a little subtle and uh, although the definition uh, tells you that you can just have two subtypes type 1 and type 2 infinity i mean basically it depends on the identity projection whether it is finite or infinite fine so if it if it does not admit any sub projection equivalent to it it is called a finite projection and if it admits a sub projection equivalent to it it is called an infinite projection very much like the notion of a finite set or an infinite set right so this is based on those two uh, criteria a uh, type 2 factor is sub classified into type 2 1 and type 2 infinity type 3 turned out to be a little more mysterious actually so so you have a continuous family of subtypes there actually fine so so these are the broad classification of factors and as i said above that these are the factors which come together to give you an arbitrary von neumann algebra so if you take any von neumann algebra it has to be the direct integral of some of these in a measurable way yeah so that is the crux that we should take from this classification result and uh, the top result of by von um, yes and now in this talk uh, we will be interested only in factors of type 2 1 and their sub factors okay so yeah now i would not i will not give you a full fledged definition of a type 2 1 factor as was defined by von neumann in his early papers as i said that you talk about you know the finiteness of the identity projections but there is a much better i would say and a more more used working definition so that that is what we will concentrate uh, that we that is what we will use in this talk actually and that is what basically some factor theorists usually stick to yeah so typically so so this is the working definition that a factor m is of type 2 1 if and only if it is infinite dimensional Just remember okay matrix algebra also has this property but this is not infinite dimensional so a factor is of type 2 1 if and only if it is infinite dimensional and admits a unique very important that's why i have bolded it a unique faithful normal tracial state from n to c fine so might be some of these terminologies are new to many of you so i'll quickly tell what this means so you have this nice linear map from m to c which sends this kind of objects, which are called positive elements of the von Neumann algebra, to strictly positive real numbers. Okay, whenever x is non-zero, one has to go to one. This is what is called a state. Uh, these two things are what we what we call state, and tracial is essentially this trace kind of 
property which you also have on a matrix algebra the usual normalized trace has these properties and the normality this normality property essentially says that it has to be continuous in the topology that we consider in the category of Voronoi algebras which is the sigma v operator topology don't worry about that but you just say that okay there is a category of Voronoi algebras the natural topology that we consider there is the sigma v topology and these maps have to be continuous with respect to that topology fine so so this is the Horton definition for a type 2 1 factor remember and it has some nice advantages of having this unique faithful normal tracial state okay you will see i think uh, that all of these properties your unique faithful normal tracial you know and state all of these are used in constructing something if you start with a two one factor okay so again now some classical examples so now again unlike general von neumann algebras it is not so easy to tell you you know that okay this von neumann algebra is going to be a two one factor so you need to kind of look a little deeply into this you remember the first example that we had of a Voronoi algebra i think i gave b of h yes so b of h as we just discussed in the uh, while having a look at the previous slide is a factor right because the only operator that commutes with everything else is just the scalar times identity operator now interestingly this is not a two one factor and the reason is that you just cannot have a tracial state on b of h yeah and the reason for that i think i can tell you that actually everything every operator can be expressed as a finite sum of some commutators you know and that tells you so you, that tells you that jesus cannot have a tracial state because tracial state of any commutator is zero so it will say that everything goes to zero you know whereas you need something which sends one to one you know positive elements to positive elements yeah so that is a proof actually But yesterday, Professor J K Verma said a nice thing that you know there should always be a proof in a talk. Okay, so this is one for you in today's talk. I I might give one more, but yeah, there won't be many. Uh, sorry about that. But. So, how about group one numeral algebra? So we just saw that if we start with a, let me go back so that you are. Oops, it's on the previous slide. Yes. So here, if I start with a discrete group. then you look at the left regular representation and you look at the double commutant which is the same as the von neumann algebra generated by the image of this left regular representation that turns out to be a von neumann algebra and that is what we call group von neumann algebra so now the question is that when is this a two one factor can it be at all or not and this actually as i said this uh, groups and group actions are factories with the initial factories to construct von neumann algebras of desired types so this is the theorem and i think this was also observed by von neumann and murray in 1930s that the group von neumann algebra lg for any discrete group g is a two one factor if and only if it's a two way characterization your g is an icc group now what do i mean by that that typically says that g's conjugacy classes are infinite so infinite conjugacy class group yeah so you ignore the trivial uh, element every non trivial element of g's in conjugacy class has to be infinite such a group is called an icc group and the corresponding group uh, von neumann algebra is actually a two one factor and the converse also holds now i'll quickly give you two examples of course without proof of such groups so if you look at the s infinity what is this this is essentially looking at permutations of the natural numbers where you permute only finitely many elements at a time yeah you don't take all bijections but you take only those bijections of natural numbers which play with only finitely many terms and the rest are just left as they are okay so this forms a group this is actually the union of sns you, know, you have s1 sitting in s2 s2 sitting in s3 and so on you look at the union of these uh, groups that is precisely what we call sn and it has this nice icc property okay then comes what we call free groups yes so fn basically says that it's a free group generated by n many generators okay i'll not get into that and likewise you have psln's so this is the quotient of slns projective quotient of slns and here n has to be greater than or equal to 3 and interestingly all these psln's contain copies of free groups okay now these group theoretic properties that we see in these groups also have a say on the two one factor that they give you yeah and one wonderful property of s infinity as we just discussed is that it is the increasing union of finite subgroups right s1 sitting in s2 sitting in s3 and so on 
So what is it that gets reflected in the 2 1 factor that we get from such groups, for instance, okay? And, uh, oh, okay, I'll come to that a little later. Before that might be, I should also tell you that we also had another factory of constructing two, uh, one one algebras, namely the cross product of one one algebras. So when are those two one factors? Fine. So here is one theorem from early days that this cross product, so if you start with a discrete group acting on a nice measure space, then the cross product is a two one factor. If, I'm not saying if and only, if, I'm saying if the axon is free and ergodic, okay, there is a notion of this in the ergodic theory language, and this measure is finite and non-atomic. So non-atomic uh, essentially says that, you know, it cannot have um, finite projections. So not finite, minimal projections. I haven't talked about it, so I'll just uh, ignore that. And a G invariant measure. Okay, so these are the notions that people play with in ergodic theory on a regular basis, and that translates to the object being a two one factor in the Bonhomme algebra. Yeah, so so these were the early examples of two one factor. And likewise, if you take a finite group and let it act on a two one factor, then this is a two one factor if the axon is outer, which means if your alpha is the axon, then alpha G has, cannot be an inner uh, automorphism on M. Means it should, not be, it should not be an adjoining map with respect to a unitary. Yes, so, so this, size, this, this kind of axons are called outer axons. And whenever you have such an axon, you get a two one factor. Okay, uh, what is the fact? Fine enough. And as I said, you know, what is the property that one has when, uh, like, like the SN, S infinity thing that when you have an increasing uh, way of finite subgroups, you know, the resulting two one factor, resulting group gives you a group on normal algebra. So how is this property reflected in the two one factor? And that is what is called hyperfinite two one factor. A factor is said to be a hyperfinite if it can be expressed as the V closer of an increasing union of finite dimensional subalgebras. Okay. So this is the analog of a property of S infinity that you see in the situation of hyperfinite uh, one factors. Okay, an example, for instance, how about and this hyperfiniteness is there in all types, type one, type two, and type three, right? And it's easy to get hold of a hyperfinite two one factor, and it is basically this. So you look at M two C, let it go in M four C and M eight C, and so on, and then there is a way to so. So the union will be a naturally, uh, natu will, union will naturally be a star algebra. And on that, you can get hold of a nice uh, tracial map. And with respect to that, you can do what is called the gelfand nymark siegel construction, get hold of a nice uh, Hilbert space. And then you let this algebra act on that Hilbert space. And then you complete it in the weak operator topology. This is what I'm expressing on the right hand side. And the resulting object that you get, it turns out to be a two one factor and the very nature of it tells us that it is a hyperfinite two one factor. Now, I think uh, from uh, as early as 1940s, Murray and Vonneman uh, realized that actually if your two one factor is hyperfinite, it has to be just one up to a, an isomorphism, namely this, whatever I have given you on the slide. That was an amazing observation by them then. But before that type one and you have already understood that the, the, the fact type one factors are only MNC or B of A. So they are already hyperfinite. So this was the project of classification of hyperfinite fa factors that actually went on from the starting of this theory in 1930s till I would say as late as 1980s, okay, by Alan Cohen. So, so I'll just list um, what are the possible uh, hyperfinite factors in each type. So type one, I just told you. Type two, there were two types in type two, two type two one and type two infinity. So I just say that this was this uh, this was observed by Murray and Vonneman in their early papers itself, that if you have a factor which is of type two one and if it turns out to be hyperfinite, means it is an increasing union of finite dimensional uh, subalgebras, then it is unique up to an isomorphism. Okay, that was an amazing result. And it's been used heavily in the whole theory of one algebras. Then comes type two infinity. How about that? Now look, look at the difference. You know, they could not understand that type two infinity will also be unique. 
although it was known that type 2 infinity has to be a type 2 one tensored with some b of h still to prove that it has to be unique took some time and it was alan cohn uh, who in 1976 established that actually in type 2 infinity also you just have one hyperfinite factor then comes type 3 and okay let me just put all this on the in front of the screen so so type 3 i say that it's parameterized by lambdas in the interval 0 to 1 okay now Krieger and Cohn's simultaneously in 76 had two different uh, papers and they combinedly actually tell us that if you restrict to type 3 lambda, then uh, for every real number t, you have precisely one hyperfinite type 3 naught factor. So what does this mean? This means that if you have a type 3 naught factor, it has to be one of those in the list. So, so the list was provided by Krieger and that uniqueness was given by Cohn's in 76. Then you come to three lambda, where lambda is between zero and one. Then again, for each lambda, you just have one. Like type two one, there is just one hyperfinite type three lambda factor. Okay, and type three one also again you have just one. Fine. So this was about the classification of hyperfinite factors. Yeah, to get hold of this uh, thing, and after that. Yeah, so now, like I said, that S infinity has this nice property, and that is what is reflected in the 2 1 factor that it is hyperfinite, whereas the free group factor does not have that property. Okay, so these were actually the two first examples of non isomorphic 2 1 factors that they came up with in 1930. Fine, so that was about uh, 2 1 factors. Yes, now why should some sub factors come into the picture? Yeah, so typically, you know, even if you are doing a group theory, then if you want to compare two groups, then sometimes it is possible that, you know, if this guy has a nice subgroup and the other guy does not have such a nice subgroup, then you can easily say that this, this, these groups are not isomorphic, right? On the other hand, you might have a situation where you can say that, okay, if a given group has a subgroup with some properties, then the top group has to be this. Yes, I, I don't have an example in my mind, but similar things or such things started happening in the theory of sub factor, theory of two one factor. So when people tr were trying to classify two one factors, when you move out of the hyperfinite situation, life is extremely difficult. You, we do not have any suitable or any, you know, classification result in that direction and nor does one see anything in near future. But if a certain 2 1 factor has a sub factor with some specific property, then it becomes easy to understand that 2 1 factor. And it can actually have a proper structure uh, that can be said explicitly. Yes, so, so that is how the study of sub factors came into the existence. And uh, uh, in 1983, Juan Jones came up with this paper, Index for Sub Factors. And that, was, that is considered to be the pioneering paper in this theory. So, so let me give you the definition. So you, what is a sub factor? It is basically a unitary inclusion of n in a given factor two one, uh, given two one factor n. So, so both have to be two one factors and they should both have the same unit, okay? That's why I said unitary inclusion. So both th these things are important here. Yes, now what is uh, all of a sudden, you start with such an object, then what is good that you can say? See, a definition, so when we define a one-on-one algebra, we say that it's a weakly closed, you know, unital star subalgebra of some B of H. Now that Hilbert space might be some abstract Hilbert space on which you have no control. Now what happens is that when you have a pair of two-one factors, then all of a sudden you can actually build a Hilbert space on which your object acts in a nice way. So you, you can really do calculations much more easily. It's a very handy thing to have actually. So, so what is it that I'm talking about? So this is what you call the standard representation basically of a two one factor and therefore of a sub factor. So you start with a two one factor M, it becomes an inner product space, right? Which is given by X, the inner product of X and Y is given by trace M of X, Y star. This is what is called the GNS construction. Now faithfulness comes into the picture to say that it is a Hilbert space. It is an inner product space, okay? And uh, its completion is denoted by L2M. Fine, this is just a notation. Uh, don't think that this is the L2 of a measure space M. Okay, so this is the common confusion uh, that I usually uh, you know, find with general audience. So, so this is just a notation for the completion of this inner product space. Okay, 
And now you see n was sitting in m, and m is sitting on v of l to m. And this is this is done by a very natural left multiplication. Okay, so so I'm not getting into that, but it's very easily seen that you know the m acts on m is already acting on m by left multiplication, so that carries forward to the l to r uh, m also. So now all of a sudden you got hold of a Hilbert space on which your subfactor is acting very nicely. Yeah, now oh, I was talking about this paper by one jo uh, Jones about index of a subfactor. So how did you get hold of this notion? So before that, before one Jones, uh, Murray, I think uh, one Newman already had this notion of dimension of an N module. So what is an N module? N module basically means that you have a Hilbert space and you have a representation from your N to B of H and which representation is a star homomorphism and it has to be continuous in the sigma weak topology again. Now, what happens here is that this L to M also therefore becomes an N module. It's an M module also as an N module, fine, because of this natural left multiplication. And the, the continuity actually comes from the normality, as I said, in this trace. Okay, so as I said, all everything that I talked about this tracial state all the good properties of this special state come into use here. Okay, so then once we have this notion of dimension of any module, then you can simply define the index of such a pair as the dimension of this module as an n mode. So this was such a cute definition that Von Jones uh, came up with, you know, and it had remarkable implications. The important theorem in that paper that he established was that actually this index is not just integer valued, it can take real values as well, and the values lie in this set. So the whole interval four to infinity is possible before four from one onwards, the index cannot be less than one, fine? Because n is a subset of n. So from one onwards, four, you see there is a discrete part in the beginning and it slowly gets accumulating towards four. Yeah, so that is how the index of subfactors behave. And all of these numbers can be realized. He gave explicit subfactors with possible index values. Okay, now I want to come from the uh, groups. Okay, so as we saw that, you know, the group one Roman algebras are factors when the groups are ICC groups. So if you start with a pair of ICC groups, H and G, then this pair, you can easily realize that LH can be made to sit inside L of G and it is a subfactor. And as expected, I would say, the index of this subfactor is precisely the index of the pair of groups, okay? Index of the subgroup in the group. On the other hand, from the cross product situation, if you have H in G acting outwardly on a two one factor M, then the cross product subfactor now, has this index. So if H is trivial, you get, we'll see, uh, it will come again. Okay, so how about the next ones? Yeah, so there are other ways of uh, obtaining some factors. Now I think uh, I have 10 minutes more. I don't know. So, hello? Yeah, uh, it's fine. Uh, okay. Um, uh, but uh, it would be good if means there might be some questions. So, uh -huh. would, so I, I can take 10 more minutes. I think we started 10 minutes late or something like that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. Okay. So I, I'll skip the other examples. Okay. And I'll move to the theory parts now. Yeah. So now I want to talk about some uh, properties of subfactors that actually lead to structure theorems. Okay. For instance, uh, when is it that we can say that a given subfactor has to be a, has to come from a cross product? So first of all, let me give this notion that a subfactor is said to be regular if the normalizers of n generate n. What are normalizers? These are unitaries which, uh, when you conjugate the lower uh, subfactor, you get it back. Okay, you remain within it. So, so those things are called normalizers. And if it turns out that those unitaries generate the whole uh, two one factor, then this pair is called to be called to be a regular subfactor. Okay. Now examples. It is quite easy to see that if M is contained in M cross G, then it is regular, right? Likewise, if you look at the subgroups of factor where H is a subgroup of G, then this turns out to be regular if and only if H is normal in G. Okay? So this is kind of generalization of the previous one. And uh, there is a theorem actually, so this is the structure theorem that I was talking about that 
every finite index, okay, the Jones index that I was talking about, a factor which has this regularity property and it's trivial, uh, if, if its centralizer is trivial, I'll just quickly define what is the centralizer, then it has to be of this type. Yeah, and this group, you, you get hold of a finite group G, which has to act on the lower uh, two one factor and the top two one factor has to be the cross product with respect to it. And the group is actually very natural. It is called the while group of the sub factor and it is given by the quotient of this normalizer and this normalizer with the unitaries of the sub factor. Okay, it's always a finite group in the uh, trivial centralizer case. So this was, this was not a theorem by one of them. It's a combined way of looking at it. Initially, it was showed that there is a co-cycle action and then, you know, Sutherland showed that every co-cycle action can be reduced to a cycle proper action and Hong gave explicitly, you know, what kind of action you can do and all that. Now the centralizer is basically this. N prime intersection M, it's also called the relative commutant, which means the collection of all those elements of M which commute with everything in the sub factor, okay? And it's a fact, uh, again, it was established by Jones that if the fine index is finite, then the relative commutant is finite dimension. Okay, this is a useful thing, that's why. And there is another name for this kind of sub factors with trivial centralizers, these are called irreducible sub factors. And the reason being that L2M turns out to be an irreducible and in binary. So, so I'm being a little quick here though. Uh, Right, we, I'll just skip some okay, so theorem. And uh, for that, I had to tell you a little more about the theory of sub factors, but might be I will uh, skip that. Okay, so I'll move to one of my works with Keshav that I mentioned uh, in the initial slides. So I had to talk about some more theory of sub factors, and that would have given me another irreducible. Uh, another structure theorem, uh, quickly speaking, what says is that, what one says is that some factors have a notion of depth, okay? And uh, if it so happens that the depth of an irreducible subfactor is of depth two, then it has to come from an action of a Cox algebra, okay? So since I did not talk about these things, might be it's okay if I skip this. Likewise, if you drop irreducibility and keep the depth, then also you have a structure result, which was kind of as recent as established in 2000. Yes, so now I want to come to ah, one question of Juan Jones. So this is what we call the analog of Hall's marriage theorem. So what is Hall's marriage theorem? It's a theorem basically in combinatorics and graph theory. I'm not going to even state that. It's suppose, I mean, it has amazing applications in these two theories. Now in group theory, you know, it has a nice consequence. And what it says is that if you have a group and a subgroup, then you can always choose a set which can act simultaneously as a left as well as a right cosets of H and G. Yeah, this is an amazing thing that happens for groups uh, there. It has a nice algebraic formulation. If you look at the group algebra of G and the group algebra of H, then the group algebra of H sits inside A and therefore B, oops, yeah, the, the bigger one can be thought of as a BB or a smaller, smaller uh, by module. And then there is another map, which is a conditional expectation. I mean, th these are some technical terms that I'm using. And uh, I'll, I'll have a slide here which gives the definition. But, but what happens with this uh, two-sided, let us say, co-states, representatives, is that this gives a basis for A as a left as well as a right B module in this following sense. So every X in A can be expressed as a left module in this type, as sorry, as a right module in this type and as a left module in this. Okay, so this is what we call a two-sided basis. Actually. Now it has a analogous definition for pairs of Vernumann algebras. So you start with a pair of unital inclusion of Vernumann algebras and you take a faithful normal conditional expectation, let us ignore the definition, then you can talk about a left pimsner popa basis. The name is attributed to these two people because they were the first you know, who came up with such uh, results actually. So it has uh, such properties that you know, every element in the top guy can be written as a finite sum of such expressions in the bottom guy. Likewise, you can talk about right pimsner popa basis and two-sided basis. And the Hall's Malice theorem for Vernumann algebras then becomes that if you have such a pair with a conditional expectation, does it or does it not have a two-sided pimsner popa basis with respect to that conditional expectation? Okay. And the bad news is that even the existence of left, forget about two-sided basis, 
is not clear in situation as generalized interval. So the natural thing to do is that how about some factors? Yeah. So we have some specific uh, one-on-one -one algebras with some very nice properties. Can we answer this question there or not? And uh, so, so, but even to raise this question, one first needs to understand where there, there is a conditional expectation whenever you start with a subfactor. And the thing is that, yes, it always is there and it follows from the trace that we had there actually. So I'll ignore all the details there. This was kind of another proof that I had in my talk. So you just take it from this slide that you take any subfactor, then it always admits a unique in the last uh, line sense, conditional expectation. So now once this has this, yeah, so once we know that every subfactor has a conditional expectation, how about the question analogous to false marriage theorem? And this was the theorem in 86, proved by Pim and Popa, that every finite index of factor ad admits a left, which is equivalent to right by just taking the adjoint basis. Fine. And uh, this itself had amazing applications. One, I would say, which, ha which, is, which is being used heavily in the whole classification program of subfactors is what we call the formalism of planar algebras for, for extremal subfactors. So I'm not getting to the technical technicality extremal by one Jones, but they are abundantly many. Actually. And what happened recently was this uh, paper by my collaborator Bashi with uh, others where they introduced the notion of angle between intermediate subfactors. Now, why is this important? It has this amazing consequence that they were able to, you know, kind of give a bound on the number of intermediate two one factors between a given pair of two one factors. So it's like in group theory, you know, you would like to count the number of subgroups. So it is in similar vein, actually. So it was a nice application of this notion of left or equivalent to right basis. Yeah. Now the question, so, so the Hall's marriage theorem question that comes to our uh, thing is that actually Jones realized that, you know, you cannot have a two-sided basis in every subfactor, but if Actually, if you have a two-sided basis, then the subfactor has to be extremal. Yeah, I am ignoring the definition of this, but you just take it that okay, there are there is certain property that is forced on the subfactor if you have a two-sided basis. So he just asks the converse that does an extremal subfactor always have a two-sided basis? And there is just one result known in this direction, and that is again follows it follows from the structure theorem that I uh, mentioned a few slides back that every irreducible regular subfactor has to be of the form cross product. And the, this group itself then happens to, you know, provide a two-sided basis. And th this actually has an amazing thing that it also has a two-sided basis consisting of irreducibles, which is a useful thing. Okay. So that was the only result that we had. We wanted to extend it by uh, dropping the irreducibility, irreducibility situation. And uh, unfortunately, we did not have any such structure theorem to work. Yeah. So we depended a lot on other theories and uh, we, what we managed was this, that every regular subfactor of finite index admits a two-sided Pimpsner Popa basis. We cannot guarantee unitary uh, basis, but just two-sided Pimpsner Popa basis. Fine. And the ingredients are this, I mean, I'll kind of just skip it here. There, there are some things from uh, C-star algebras. There's something called generalized wild group. I already talked about wild group. You know, in this situation, one has to talk about the generalized wild group, some coset representatives. There are some patch techniques. And so essentially speaking, we find uh, basis, two-sided basis for the first inclusion using the first two techniques, commuting squares and uh, path algebras by Sundar and Okniano. And then we find uh, two-sided basis for the second inclusion by what we call the generalized wild group. And then we have a suitable patching technique, you know, that allows us to multiply them to get hold of a two-sided basis for the bigger inclusion. So, so that, that is, I would say, the way we went about it. And regarding applications of two-sided basis, we are still exploring, you know, we don't know much you know, how well it can be used. But one cute application that we found is that this. Actually, it was known that a regular subfactor always has integer index, but the value was, the, 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 there was no formula for the index, actually. Now, what we have now been able to do is that the index has to be given uh, in terms of the product of the cardinality of this generalized while group that appeared in the previous slide and the dimension of the centralizer. So the, this could be useful. We will see. And this, I, yeah, so these two last results were essentially from this paper uh, with Keshav and it's just got accepted recently. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for such a nice talk.
so if uh, anyone uh, having some question they can unmute themselves and ask please ask hello i have yeah, a, i i have a naive question so if you take a group with a harmonic locally compact group and you just take l infinity g mu where mu is the harmonic on g would that right. work on neumann algebra Yes, I think it will act on L two of G with respect to the same measure as multiplication operators. Okay. And I... it will be weakly closed. Yeah, yeah. It should not have. It. Actually, on every measure space, you can do that. Okay. Yeah. If you But... want some specific properties, then you better have nice uh, things about your measure. Okay. Yeah. I see. So some. So that is known. Which kind of properties you need for the measure? So, for instance, like if you want it to be a uh, two and factor, for instance, right? then the one for most requirement is that it should not have the, the measure should not be atomic okay so not yeah, that is one basic thing and then of course since it is the har measure it is already uh, g invariant right and yeah. um, the the action i think is also free and ergodic right translation action so uh, ergodic no free is free so then we might have issues no it depends on the group right you cannot ah, have so a exactly. ergodic so you, on yeah so you want some specific properties on your group that will force ergodicity of this uh, action yeah 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 you need to be having yeah hmm. it won't work for abelian groups for example so. it can't be abelian groups give you abelian monomial algebra yeah. which are never factor right yeah okay thank you yeah. nice talk thank you so i have a question yes uh, is is there any if and only condition for the cross product to be a two one factor yeah i had deliberately skipped it actually because i forgot <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but i think they have something you know that if it is a two one factor then what uh, kind of things do you want on your measure space and on the action yes right okay. yeah i think sundar's book on invitation to one one algebra has a better description of these things so. okay thanks yes, Yeah. Thanks for the excellent talk. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so, anyone else uh, uh, having some question? Uh, very good talk. Very good talk. Uh, and uh, th there is book by Sundar and Jones also. And yes, uh, yes. Uh, Jones has given many lectures at IMSC and abroad. And Jones is giving a lecture uh, in two days or something, one or two days. You can check the website of researchseminars.org. And okay. another thing that I would like to bring to the notice of people present here is that planar algebras, which uh, Ved Prakash Gupta studies so very well, are being used by computer scientists a lot. Oh, you know, okay. Uh, okay. Jimmy Vakari at University of Oxford and his team are using oh. planar algebras a lot, and Sundar and Kodyalam have also taken that work further a lot with their students group. And even Louis Kaufman, who was here at uh, TIMC conference, he is using planar algebra and is a, a collaborator also from uh, the, from that place. Okay, so what the things that Ved Prakash uh, presented, you know, they are very much. Uh, being taken up by okay. other branches of mathematics also very successfully and uh, i am very happy to see that thank you okay so uh, if there is no more question then we can thank again uh, uh, wait for this excellent talk <laughs> Thank you.